so I finally played Star Wars Battlefront 2. Since the beta that stole almost a dozen hours from me, I must have thought the game was doing something right. And I know what. Back then, I felt Battlefront 2 captured the chaotic but calming casual multiplayer battles that kept Call of Duty spinning in my 360 until Ghosts, only with far more players' polish and production behind its construction. It held attention, but not to the point of consuming all of my senses, and I think it's important to have that experience. As much as I adore story-based games that have me closing the blinds and turning off all notifications, sometimes you just want to unwind and unload. Unfortunately, EA assumed those words referred to consumers' wallets rather than blasters. The loot boxes and progression system attached to them drastically altered the context of Battlefront 2's gameplay. When winning the match quickly resulted in fewer credits than intentionally prolonging it, wrapped controllers like my days at Quality Assurance was inevitable. What's fascinating as a result of this scandal, the effects of which are still being felt, is while games these days can evolve exceptionally in just a year, Battlefront 2 is virtually identical at its core. Fighting a Naboo hasn't changed one bit, because its evolution wasn't about addressing faults with the gameplay, but what surrounded it. And with that, the question becomes, what remains? For the most part, an emphatically beautiful title whose presentation manages to capture the spectacle of not just scripted single-player experiences within multiplayer, but the franchise it's representing. And even a non-fan like myself is able to appreciate the attention to detail in its textures, effects, and sounds to capture the atmosphere and tone of Star Wars across a wide variety of environments, from the metallic hallways of Starkiller Base to the jungles of Kashyyyk. While the Frostbite engine has strong competition these days, there's no question that when utilized properly, it can create one of the most beautiful games out there, combined with audio that manages to echo the iconic sounds of old while giving them a distinct punch necessary for a game in this genre. Music in particular is key to how Battlefront manages to maintain a sense of cohesion, intelligently using cues and ambience during loading and stat screens, leading into the bombastic anthems played during matches. All of this extenuates the action itself, that's smooth as silk with wonderful animations, responsive controls, excluding melee, and surprisingly accurate weapons that don't require aiming down sights, encouraging players to push rather than stay put. Encounters in this game are certainly a step above what I recall from DICE's debut with Star Wars thanks to the classes, split between Assault, Heavy, Officer, and Specialist. Their absence from the previous game was felt, and the benefits of its inclusion are immediate. Combat has more variety, as you have to actively consider the person's basic abilities and how they can potentially use them to put you down, which of course, works the other way. They straddle the line between hard and soft counters. Anyone is capable of taking down an opponent, but depending on positioning abilities and how both are used, one class can truly shine where another may struggle. It's always a satisfying rush when the Assault's Vanguard perk leads to half a dozen kills. I even appreciate granting one class the ability to spot rather than everyone, something that's transferred to DICE's latest Battlefield title. It forces players to take in the environment rather than exclusively rely on the heads-up display, making the game even more immersive. Creating a multiplayer experience that has this much consistent spectacle is something I'd commend, and is certainly distinct from where the most popular multiplayer experiences are headed these days. But while Battlefront 2 certainly grabbed my attention, as the hours ticked by, its grasp started to become limp. And it's due to how DICE made multiplayer so visually stimulating. The reason Rush from Bad Company 2 is so beloved by players where things like Heist from Hardline and Galactic Assault from Battlefront aren't is mostly from its depth. Erica Harbor might have the same objectives each time, but the number of ways they can both be captured and protected is what kept people coming back to that game for years. When the map was first played on the private beta, most in my experience would collect every tank, Humvee, ATV, and UAV to throw themselves at the entrance. But after the game's full release, players started to get more creative working together to reach high vantage points quickly with the ATV, so snipers could spot enemies and allow tanks to shoot them from a safe distance. This is just one example, but it applies to nearly every level and objective in that game. Though there's one exception with Erica Harbor, and that's a site on the second zone, placed within an indestructible boxed environment. This objective is Battlefront 2's standard. The reason Naboo hasn't changed since I played it over a year ago is because the level's design only allows limited player expression. The layout's almost entirely flat, with the only verticality being staircases. The first objective of escorting a vehicle is entirely automated, with the only influence attackers have is stopping the defenders from using ion cannons. And this is followed up by two objectives within corridors tight enough to not allow for flanking. Galactic Assault is so consistently cinematic because they don't have room for players to approach objectives creatively. 
When I spawn on Kashyyyk with gorgeous sunlight reflecting off destroyed vehicles and players charging my position over the horizon, that excitement became dull after realizing enemies had few other options. The reason Galactic Assault captures the presentation of single-player set pieces is that the mode is structured like one, just with players amongst NPCs. Yes, the removal of tokens is a godsend for immersion, but matches in this game still feel just as rigged, which is why I found more enjoyment in smaller modes where it's more likely to contribute to the fight as an individual player. The emphasis on encounters with a semblance of tactics reveal themselves and show the positives of Battlefront 2's gameplay. It becomes a relaxing run-and-gun affair I enjoyed in the beta so much. There's just one problem. Iron Sight has come out since then, with better level design, matchmaking, game modes, balance, rewards, progression, and gameplay for free. And these smaller modes reveal Battlefront 2's quibbles along with its successes. Primarily is the game's community that split amongst nine playlists, just like the game's predecessor, and its star card system. In my experience, matchmaking in dice games only works when the user base is higher than Netflix, which is why when Battlefield games age, most veterans resort to using the server browser one that doesn't exist in Battlefront 2. I'd like to go more in depth with Strike, Heroes, and Starfighter Assault, but I can't when consistently dropped into empty lobbies, and because bots only work in arcade mode, you're forced to wait for a match that'll never start. As par for the course with poor matchmaking, teams can also become horrendously unbalanced and without the chance of a moderator to do something about it, only encourages people to abandon matches. And when teams are balanced in skill level, the game's upgraded cards rear their ugly head. The significance of said upgrades has decreased since launch, but it's an unavoidable truth that the people playing this game the most are also more powerful. And I just can't see the point of it. Imagine if those who played Overwatch for a thousand hours got a slightly more powerful revolver, or Diamond Siege players getting a larger blast radius for grenades. The enjoyment of PvP multiplayer games, at least in my eyes, is using a tool set and learning how to succeed with it, not upgrading said tools for the mere act of using them as is required with time. But as the latter was what this game built itself around, it's unsurprising the shrapnel from EA's blast has laced itself beneath. Arcade mode had the potential to dial back the clock, stand as a big budget tribute to the days of yore with arena shooters on PC and split screen gems on consoles. Yet its inclusion only puzzles me, not an objection to its ideas, but the execution. Because arcade mode, whether in scenarios or custom matches, doesn't even scratch the most baseless itch. There's no blending of eras, level adjustments, significant modifiers. There's not even an objective mode. The most creative arcade mode gets is making Instagib. It's just so mind-numbingly basic that even its brief duration of one to two hours feels like an eternity. I understand it's not in a company's interest to preserve games and it'll inevitably lead to gems of our past being left behind. But can't this at least have some fun? If it's not made to replicate multiplayer but lacks any unique gameplay opportunities of its own besides kill lots of enemies, why bother? Though this will relate into my conclusion. All that remains then is the much requested single player campaign, and unfortunately due to my criticisms and thought process, I can't discuss it without spoilers. All I can say before continuing is that it did exactly what I didn't want it to do. Imagine this story with the roles reversed, informing us of our hero's background, working for noble warriors since childhood, raised by a father who's devoted their life to not just their brothers in arms, but everything they stand for, learning, fighting, and training to become the most elite of special forces under the leader's wing, fighting alongside fellow soldiers in this unit for decades, witnessing not just death and destruction within villages and cities, but entire worlds to which our hero, over the course of weeks, is pulled to the opposing side, becoming in the eyes of people within the world and to us the viewers outside of it, evil. Someone who's betrayed everything they've stood for in the blink of an eye. This is a story we never tell because it's as abhorrent as it is absurd. It'd be impossible to relate with a character who does this because human beings don't change like an AI's had their boot drive swapped. So why are we expected to believe the opposite? Why is it that as long as it's someone turning to the right side that this unbelievable character shift is permitted? Well, it's because the writers had no choice. We knew right from the get-go that our characters were going to have to defect. And there's a very, very good reason why. Because we knew our game was going to carry all the way up to the sequel trilogy. And we couldn't have our characters transfer over from the Empire to the First Order because our game was coming out before Return of the Jedi. 
and a lot of stuff about the First Order had not yet been revealed. So we couldn't just suddenly be, you know, scooping The Last Jedi a month in advance with all these First Order revelations. We couldn't do that. So that was always going to be from the get-go. Our characters were going to have to defend. This interview put a lot of my initial criticisms of Battlefront 2's campaign into perspective, hence the video's delay and rewrite, and I'll be referencing it throughout. Listening to it definitely confirmed suspicions while playing that this wasn't a unified effort, but a multifaceted collaboration. Writers were brought on board to assist EA Motive in helping DICE include what was absent while Criterion improved the much derided aerial combat. Through this jumbled development reminiscent of Ubisoft, there's not a lack of effort here. The campaign does have moments of intrigue and solid writing, with the storytelling high point being Luke's appearance. Not because of who's the cameo, I couldn't care less, it's because Luke's character gives a compelling reason for why an elite soldier on the other side, who's already doubting their leaders, would defect. It's just unfortunate then that this is seen during the gameplay low point of slashing bugs in a blocked off canyon. I can summarize Battlefront 2's campaign with the following. It's what I thought Titanfall 2's was going to be. A predictable shooting gallery that's having to make the most of levels, assets, and gameplay not intended for its design. The story maximizes, much to its own detriment, the game's planets, heroes, and enemies. Only a handful of environments are exclusive to the campaign, one of which being that low and high point combo. The rest consists of space battles, corridors, and levels from multiplayer, which isn't objectionable, but a reliance on wave defense rivaling that of the original Destiny is. Especially when four of said sections are with supposed heroes that players supposedly love and are wasted on gameplay that only exists to prolong the campaign especially when their actions barely relate to Aiden's personal story, and instead take a break to connect to other events in the Star Wars universe. It's almost like there's two storylines in this game, a personal tale of a soldier caught between two worlds, and an epilogue to Return of the Jedi, which, frankly, might have been a solid move. Having an optionally first-person campaign following a new cast of characters, jarringly swapped to a third-person romp of established Star Wars heroes pursuing their own goals, didn't flow for me. Feeling like Aiden's campaign could have had a distinct three-act structure of Empire, Rebel, Resistance, and the actions of Lando, Luke, Leia, and Han being the post-launch expansion. But while the game's issues of character hopping, conflicted combat design, lack of detail, and stiff dialogue infuriated me in the moment, I can't muster up much passion upon writing about it. From the contrast of its execution to the talent behind it, I doubt there's much more the team could have done. I don't envy the position of the scripters, designers, or writers of this campaign needing to make something that's unique and personal, while its reason for existing is neither. On the other hand, previous DICE adventures have shown that team was capable of innovating within similar restrictions, and I can't help but feel with Aiden especially, there's a slew of missed opportunities. In most mediocre shooter campaigns, the protagonist has little to develop, but with Aiden, she actually has too much. Within this one story, including Resurrection as the writer saw it as a third act, Aiden witnesses her army's downfall, has her beliefs challenged, betrays her faction, squad, and father, falls in love, becomes a mother, and sacrifices herself for the resistance. Most of these things could have engulfed an entire campaign, especially those last two, but instead they're all briefly visited for a handful of chapters without the depth and duration to execute their potential. And it's a shame too, because Hunt the True Season 2 star Janita Gavinkar as a character whose allegiances are tested, and both she and the story were phenomenal. And this game's campaign, with all of its motion capture, cinematics, and presentation, could have put that to shame. I was actually reminded a lot of Infinite Warfare's campaign while playing this game, as it has the same limp-wristed stealth mechanics, semi-open level design, and over-reliance on space combat. But that campaign, for all its flaws, knew that its brief timeline was enough. That the story's urgency would allow its themes to connect players to the characters and struggles they go through. Where Battlefront 2, despite having a far more interesting plotline on paper, falls underneath its own weight. And in fact, that summarizes the package as a whole. To revisit the question, why did the developers bother with arcade mode? I believe it's because the name, Battlefront, demands it. In the same way it demands multiple eras, third person and first person perspectives, and heroes. But based on DICE and EA's actions, they aren't interested in meeting these demands, not in full. And that's perfectly fine, but I don't get the sense that DICE are making a creative statement with Battlefront. Their signature depth is absent, the vehicle combat is done by Criterion, the campaign's done by Motive, and the progression was influenced by their overlords. All of this would be fine if it was to rekindle the fanbase of the games this is based on, but it's not. It doesn't allow Star Wars fans to be and let them run wild with their creativity and desires, 
despite being the only people that'll have a true appreciation for the campaign's efforts to connect itself to the world they love so much. Battlefront 2 isn't just a video game, it's a vacuum that sucks up the superb talent in this industry and fails to give them the platform to express themselves at the best of their ability. <sighs> Look, Battlefront 2 isn't a bad game, it's just kind of depressing. After the last string of relatively serious videos I've done, I need to just visit something I loved again. Something done by a single team who loved it even more. And I think I know what to do. When will you admit that Magna Carta is flawed? Never! Sparky asks, when's the next episode of the All Skulls On podcast? When you take it over from Actman. He also asks, why are you such a fucking loose? Oh. How do Canadians decide which moose gets to run the country every election? By whichever moose stabs the most cars in a month, to which we praise him as our superior overlords. Bad Company 2 retrospective when? I don't really know what I could add to the conversation, but who knows? Maybe it'll happen someday. Its servers are still up. Do you think there are any genres that cannot evolve any further? Definitely not, but I do think some genres have it harder than others. I love racers, but it's no secret that driving games can't really advance simulations of tracks, physics, and vehicles, meaning that evolution is going to come from somewhere else. Have you ever played a game where the ending single-handedly either makes or breaks it? I believe games are an art form that requires so much time investment that it's hard for an ending to single-handedly erase or redeem the rest of the experience. That and I've never just been the type of person to have a journey spoiled by the destination. But this is a damn good question. The closest I can answer is in regards to Axe. I just call it Bioshock Syndrome whenever a game completely skips the rails and loses all momentum in the third act. Dying Light and Alien Isolation come to mind. Meanwhile, Soma was so heartbreaking I remember it exactly to this day. Is this picture cursed? No comment. <laughs>